Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this panel on resilience, recovery, and sustainability in Central America, uh, a discussion to accompany the launch of our second annual report on the region uh, with CABE, uh, the Central American Bank for Economic Integration. Uh, I'm John Orchard, OMFIS CEO, and thank you very much for joining us. It's a very international audience today uh, across government, policy and finance, uh, public and private uh, from around the world. Uh, do ask us questions in the chat function uh, and I'll put them to our panel in the course of the discussion. Uh, and we're very keen uh, to engage with you on those as we go. There are some very interesting developments and opportunities in the region as it bounces back from COVID as you'll hear uh, and as it benefits uh, from a range of initiatives to spur the economy, uh, uh, which we'll come back to as well, uh, supported and encouraged by CABE. Um, we're lucky to discuss the themes today with the bank's executive president, Dante uh, Mossi, as well as Victoria Hernandez Amora, uh, the Ministry of Economy, Industry and Commerce uh, for Costa Rica, uh, Louis Taylor, uh, Chief Executive, United Kingdom Export Finance, and Sir Adrian White, who is president uh, of Bywater, which is a globally active water treatment company uh, headquartered in the UK uh, with uh, investments in Central America. Uh, my senior research colleague, uh, Natalia Ospina, uh, a Colombian in fact, uh, will briefly take you through what we found uh, in 2021 uh, in a moment. Uh, the region had a strong recovery from the initial COVID hit, uh, as I mentioned, uh, but it's also uh, benefiting from broader changes, including, for example, nearshoring for the US, and we'll explore that, uh, and from the economic integration supported by KEBE through infrastructure projects, for example, uh, and from uh, developing local and international uh, capital markets. Uh, FDI is duly following, uh, and we'll talk about that. And indeed, the US Vice President, uh, Kamala Harris, uh, called for more private entities to invest there when she launched the partnership for Central America in May uh, last year. Uh, we'll explore all of that, and indeed the underlying theme of sustainability uh, in just a moment. But in the meanwhile, uh, Natalia, over you for uh, an overview of our report. Uh, see you in a moment. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to the presentation of the second edition of this report about Central America's resilience, recovery and sustainability that OMFIF publishes together with the Central American Bank for Economic Integration, CABE. I'm Natalia Ospina, Deputy Head of Reports here at OMFIF, and in the next couple of minutes, I will go over some of the contents of the report, but I do encourage you all to download the report that will be available on OMPIF and CABE's website where you can get much more information and details. Well, in the report, we look at the eight countries that conform Central America, and we analyze them through six pillars that we believe give a holistic economic and investment overview of the region. The first pillar, pillar one, gives a macroeconomic overview of the countries of the region, and we analyze this through the basic economic indicators, such as GDP, unemployment, inflation, external debt, etc. And this year, we also uh, present the region's vaccination rates, and we also include a special focus on remittances. Now, as you can see from this graph, Central America's recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic is well underway. The region is estimated to have grown 6.9% year on year in 2021 on the back of its close relationships with uh, the US, the resilience of its remittances and rapidly improving vaccination rates. And as you can see also from the chart in the next five years to 2026, Central America's real economy is likely to expand by 4.1%, which is above the global average of 3.6% and also the 2.6% average of the rest of Latin America and the Caribbean. This high growth rate would hopefully contribute to the efforts of regional governments to deal with the higher debt burdens left by the pandemic. As you can see on the chart before you, Panama, the Dominican Republic, and Belize had the highest increase in their external public debt to GDP ratios between 2019 and 2020. For instance, Belize's external public debt ended 2020 at 84% of GDP, but the country raised 364 million on a blue bond, which is said to have lowered the country's debt burden by 12% and at the same time secured funds for Belize's marine conservation efforts. Now, moving on to pillar two, 
sustainable investment. This chapter showcases Central America's mitigation and adaptation efforts to make its economies more resilient, and it also explores sustainable investment opportunities in the region. CAVE has been a leader in Central American sustainability efforts, and since 2015, around 41% of its loan portfolio has been dedicated to sustainability-related activities. Now, in 2020, CAVE issued a $375 million green bond, and during 2021, it issued four ESG bonds, three social bonds and one green bond for a total of $1.2 billion. The Green Climate Fund has approved many projects in the region, including plans to combat deforestation in Nicaragua, incentivize adaptation efforts in the region's SMEs, build a railway in Costa Rica, and strengthen the resilience of the dry corridor and the arid zones in the Dominican Republic. So in the report, we cover this and many other projects that the region is developing to achieve a sustainable economic growth and also to contribute to the world's fight against climate change. Now, in Pillar 3, we give an overview of foreign direct investment inflows, experts of goods and services, and the main trade and investment partners of Central America. And as you can see on the table before your screen, Central America was not spared from the worldwide slowdown in foreign direct investment in 2020. Inflows fell in all the countries in the region, with Panama experiencing the highest drop a year on year. To attract greater investment to Central America, CABE has provided $50 million of seed capital to a new private equity fund known as Core BCE that is expected to amount to $1 billion, and it in intends to mobilize international private resources into the region's projects. Now, experts in all the blocks in Latin America took a hit from the global recession. In Central America, total exports of goods and services fell 14% year on year in 2020. But when we took a closer look, it was clear that the tourism and travel related services sector was the main driver of this fall, which is actually good news because it just shows that there is a temporary impact that has actually started to recede as international travel resumes and economies start to reopen again. Now, once we included the travel-related services from the analysis, we got the chart before your eyes. And here you can see Central America's resilience as it only experienced a contraction in its export values of 1%, which is much smaller than the other blocks in Latin America. Commodities played a very important role in this minor drop in 2020, and they continued to show a positive trend last year as data up to September 2021 showed year-on-year -year increase in the prices of all the region's main export commodities. Now, moving to pillar four, here we analyze the financial integration efforts of Central America, and this year we present the ongoing project to set up Central America's regional market for local sovereign debt securities and the regional investment fund. And as we, did, as we did last year, we also evaluate the country's banking sector based on the standard global financial indicators. Now, I will not give much detail about Central America's regional debt market because we have the pleasure to have Dr. Dante Mosi, president of CABE, joining us in the panel in a few minutes, and I'm sure he will be delighted to talk more about this. But just to give you a very brief overview, this regional market will integrate Central American sovereign debt markets, acting as a centralized trade repository that will keep electronic transaction records. It will enable cross-border securities clearing and settlement, and it will also provide custody services for all these uh, sovereign bonds issued by the governments of the region. Passing now to Pillar 5, about digital economy, this is a new addition to this year's report. Um, of course, the pandemic has accelerated the digital revolution around the world, and we wanted to include this new chapter to analyze the state of the digital infrastructure and services in Central America and its e-commerce capabilities. In this chapter, we also explore different digital initiatives and investments that are going on in Central America. One of these initiatives is the Central American Digital Trade Platform that together with an application called Cadena, they enable interoperability between customs and other border entities 
and they also use blockchain to facilitate data exchange, which has and will continue to enhance the efficiency of regional supply chain and will highly benefit commerce in the region. The report includes many more case studies, so I invite you all to have a look at this interesting new chapter of our report. The final pillar, Pillar 6, examines the state of Central America's economic integration. The UN's Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, ECLAC, describes Central America as the most commercially integrated bloc of the region, and nations have realized that they have much more to gain from increasing the regional unity, and their integration efforts go beyond commerce, as we show in the report. So, for instance, they have many important infrastructure projects in the pipeline and integration efforts in the energy sector is a priority. There is also a focus on increasing the supply of natural gas as part of the region's efforts to move away from fossil fuel energy sources. There are also efforts around railroad networks to improve regional connectivity and also the region is working on creating a regional regulatory framework for private-public partnerships, which will be very beneficial for international investors. And finally, peppered throughout the report, we have country pages that provide an overview of each of the countries of the region. Uh, we include some highlights and challenges of each economy and the, their investment opportunities, and we, they also have focus boxes with some macroeconomic trade and foreign direct investment indicators. And on this note, I end this very short overview of some of the contents of this year's report. Uh, and I really encourage our audience to download the report from our website or CAPE's website. Let me hand over to you, John, again for the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Natalia, and to uh, you, uh, your colleagues, and indeed the colleagues at uh, CAPE for putting together this, uh, this terrific uh, report. Uh, do please all. Uh, downloaded very clear and concise uh, um, overview, which I think you'll all find very useful. Thank you, panel, for joining me. We're delighted, as I uh, say, to have Dante, Victoria, uh, Louis, and Sir Adrian um, with us. Uh, we're going to start to explore, as I know there are uh, investors, sovereign wealth funds, and others listening. We're going to start on the topic of um, FDI. Um, uh, Natalia mentioned that it had taken a bit of a dent during COVID, as we've seen elsewhere, but it's now. Uh, making a recovery. So I'd like to explore that in a bit more detail uh, from all of your perspectives, starting with you, Dante. What have we seen on uh, FDI and what is the region doing to uh, to recover it? Uh, what's the rationale for it and what is CAVE doing to support it? Thank you. Um, and well, thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, you know, during the crisis, uh, all the governments actually took up a public debt, as you show in the report. So there's a big push towards uh, public policy, uh, uh, private uh, public uh, partnerships. And Cabe um, has been very actively uh, uh, enabling governments uh, to, to get up to speed in PPPs. And, um, and they are deciding to actually do services that were normally not provided by the private sector, including uh, water and sanitation, uh, you know, uh, road services. So um, with this, I mean, I think this is an actual invitation for uh, companies, uh, private sector from all over the world to actually to join these efforts of Central America to do things differently. I mean, the same objective is to provide a service to the public, but with the support of the private sector. So, uh, and uh, with that, Akave has been actually not only providing support and technical assistance, but also in the actual financing of the operations to the private sector investor that wants to come and, and join. And there's a good record of uh, PPPs uh, in, in the region in different fashions. I mean, it could be for services like hospital services, uh, not only infrastructure like a road, but a port or an airport. Uh, but I think it's, it's uh it's interesting to get more familiar with the region through Cabe. Uh, we have a really broad spectrum. Uh, and also we are using the support of uh, the friends of the region. And in this case, you have been one of the new partners to, to come uh, on board. And I think it's very valuable to enable companies in the UK, for example, to come and, and, and do business in the region without the fear that I'm investing in God knows uh, which land uh, this is. So, um, but Cabe is, is there as well. So I think it's a, it's a win-win situation uh, in which private sector companies can come 
and join this effort in all the countries. I mean, uh, the Dominican Republic, Panama, El Salvador, Honduras, they all have requested support uh, on the uh, PPP uh, capabilities of government agencies to deliver these uh, services and infrastructure services in a transparent way. So companies uh, do not feel that they are being you know, uh, played by, by the system. So, so we're very delighted to see these changing trends, uh, which is more sustainable because at the end, the private sector and, you know, set an, an enabler uh, for having continuous uh, service. Well, we'll explore perhaps the mechanics of that in, in more detail at the moment. Uh, the uh, public-private partnership we know around the world is important with uh, constrained um, public balance sheets. Natalia mentioned those. Uh, perhaps we can look into the mechanics of uh, the, the degree to which a private sector can be given a degree of comfort to make these investments uh, in a moment. So we'll come back to that, uh, Dante. Thanks very much. Um, Victoria, your uh, country uh, is, a, is a notable uh, beneficiary of FDI, uh, as we uh, point out in the report. Perhaps you could tell us um, what exactly people are drawn to, what they're investing in, uh, and how you are encouraging them uh, to do it, uh, Victoria. And then we'll go back to some of the uh, 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 investors in a moment. Over to you, Victoria. Well, hello again. Um, yes. Well, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, very well. Good Great. to see you. Uh, no, I think, uh, you know, after we went through, uh, now that we are going through the pandemic, we realized uh, how necessary were all these PPPs, but also how necessary it was to to arrange all the articulation or rearrange all the articulation among the government institutions, private institutions, chambers, you know, and everything had to do, you know, everything we made was in the, with the idea of getting a strength. So in FDI specifically, Costa Rica has the possibility of attract investments for medical devices. We attracted important enterprises from different parts of the country. Green projects all the time are projects that have a very, has a power, you know, a specific power, specifically in tourism or green investments, clean technologies, circular economy, and what we have been working very hard, the transformation of the agriculture in agroindustry with clean technologies. So everything was reinvented and it was in every level. So the, I think most of the FDI was technologies and medical devices, I think so. Uh, okay. So, uh, excuse me, um, in yeah. education uh, also, we attracted a lot of investment and I think uh, we can export a lot of services also in construction, in the area of construction. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Victor. And I'd like to explore uh, nearshoring as well in a moment um, uh, with you and Dan. It's a fascinating development uh, with, with large uh, secular uh, forces underpinning it, I think. Um, I'd like to uh, turn uh, to uh, um, investors. Um, Sir Adrian, uh, your company uh, is active in the region. Um, uh, and we'll come in a moment to the support that the UK government um, uh, can give to companies uh, in the UK that wish to invest in Central America. But tell me, Adrian, about your activities in there and what attracts you to the region uh, as, a, as a corporate investor. Um, we have been in, uh, for instance, Panama for over 40 years, and we have constructed the bulk of their water treatment plants. Um, we have um, private public um, ventures or BOOTs uh, in uh, Mexico and uh, the British Virgin Isles outside of Central America, but also in Panama. And uh, these are of long standing and have all been proved successful and a learning curve because the supply of water is something which is essential and tends to come first, whereas the sewage treatment is not seen as much of an asset, when actually there are huge benefits for privatizing that. And that is what attracts us. And the one scheme we have um, are very, very proud of in Managua has turned around both the health, the ability to increase uh, recreation on their lake, 
and uh, fishing, um, production of um, some uh, 12,000 cubic meters of fertilizer for farming from the sludge, using the gas flared off from the methane on the site to power itself. So uh, there are huge benefits, particularly for health, because uh, in the Managua Health Authority have indicated that the um, reduction in uh, diarrhea and malaria and hepatitis A and so on is, has been substantial solely because the sewage is treated and the lake is now becoming clean. Clean enough, in fact, after 14 years, so within two or three years, they'll be able to use it as a drinking water source of water. Uh, so in your case, there's a, a strong uh, combination of both uh, uh, commercial engagement, also an underlying sustain sustainability uh, development story uh, in the region as well. Huge sustainability and uh, health benefits, yes. And we'll explore that in more detail uh, in a moment. Uh, Louis, tell me a little bit about uh, the UK's involvement in the region in as much as the uh, government, uh, uh, government backed finance helps support engagement uh, in Central America. Well, thanks very much indeed, John. I mean, uh, I would uh, wholeheartedly agree with what uh, the previous panelists have said in terms of uh, the trends that we're seeing in inward investment to Central America. And the region shouldn't beat itself up too much about the last year or two. Everyone's seen a fall off an FDI, everyone will see a rebound. But the thing that will ensure the rebound is strongest is really uh, around political stability and around the regulatory environment for businesses where uh, ensuring strong rule of law, equal treatment for uh, foreign investors with uh, domestic investors, ability to repatriate capital, all of those pretty well-trodden uh, you know, uh, regulatory paths yeah. uh, are critical to attracting that uh, investment. But the last year and a half, I think is also, panelists have mentioned, accelerated massively the focus on sustainable business uh, and that in a range of ways. And certainly the mission of UK export finance is to ensure no viable UK export fails for want of finance or insurance. And that concept of viability increasingly encompasses sustainability uh, as well. So we're very keen to ensure that the wall of green finance that's out there to invest in developing market clean infrastructure that doesn't really have the risk appetite to do that right. is able to invest. And we will be looking to do that by finding ways of taking slices of difficult risk that inhibits private sector money going in. And by our taking that as the UK government, it will catalyze private money to come into projects because as Victoria will well know, sovereign balance sheets can't do all of this. Exactly. Uh, the, and the sliver of risk that you're talking about that, uh, that people would like help with, uh, it relates, does that relate to political and regulatory risk, which you well, think look, are can, improving anyway? We, we could certainly cover political risk, but actually it's commercial risks, right. uh, such as uh, taking a first loss piece right. or uh, yes. giving a completion guarantee on a project that involves a technology new to the region okay. and investors haven't seen it before. Uh, those or guaranteeing a power purchase agreement. Uh, those sorts of, uh, of interventions could help catalyze private sector. Yeah, private, providing comfort in project financing. Exactly, yeah. de-risking okay. projects. Yeah. Okay, fine. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll look at some of those. Um, Dante, I touched on, um, on near shoring, and this is a rather interesting development, I think, for the region. Uh, can you expand on that, please? What's, uh, what's driving that, uh, and how is it benefiting the region, uh, and how may it attract more? Nearshoring, and perhaps we'll explore that in Costa Rica as well. Sure. Uh, I mean, during the pandemic, it was very clear that the supply chains fail, and particularly in, in medical supplies that were badly needed, uh, the, the world really paralyzed, uh, got paralyzed. So, yeah, and um, so it was essential to uh, for Central America to rethink this strategy: what it needed to manufacture nearby, and even how to supply markets nearby, and. Uh, uh, you know, the largest trading partner of Central America is the U.S. And uh, even U.S. supply chains were actually affected by uh, this uh, freeze of uh, how goods and services will move uh, in those two years. So I, uh, the effort of the region has been how to become more competitive. I mean, of course, there's the Panama Canal, which is uh, by far, I think, the, 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 the most valuable asset in terms of uh, nearshoring. But uh, beyond that, I mean, it's, it's essential for ports, roads, and uh, electricity services to be reliable and well-priced to attract 
uh, more companies to come to this region and uh, and realize that it is possible to do more than uh, it was possible before. I mean, uh, you know, I think there's this uh, ladder in which uh, the countries are moving on. I mean, from uh, first uh, just cutting, uh, you know, textiles to manufacture shirts or, or uh, garments. Now it's uh, light manufacturing of um, uh, parts of vehicles and to medical supplies. So uh, the effort of uh, Central America now is how to move move up that ladder a bit more and entice some uh, producers to, to move closer to Central America. I mean, just by a way of, I think, as an example, um, Honduras just uh, finished the main uh, road that actually cuts across the Atlantic and Pacific. And in less than five hours, you can remove between uh, coasts in the lar largest highway uh, between the the Pacific corridor of Central America and the Caribbean uh, Sea. So basically, uh, Central America is becoming more competitive. I mean, it's, uh, we are closer of providing just-in-time uh, services to the U.S. market, which is very demanding. So we can uh, export uh, avocados from Costa Rica directly to the supermarket shelves in, in the U.S. In, in a couple of days. So this is obviously an advantage that a company or a country in Asia cannot do. So this is the, uh, you know, the competitive advantage. And uh, for that, infrastructure services must be uh, first class. And uh, you should work like a Swiss clock, like they say, <laughs> and, and uh, deliver the, the goods and services in a very you know, uh, tight schedule. So, um, so again, I think the, the need shoring, uh, so what I, what I wanted to say about this road that I was recently inaugurated, um, I had a chat with the National Manufacturer Association of the US, and they were just saying, uh, this is just music to our ears because uh, we have suffered uh, or, uh, you know, in getting the supply for uh, many things that we actually consume in the US. And uh, we find ourselves, you know, with our hands tight because we cannot access to our suppliers in, in Asia. So we need to move some of that supply near, nearby to ensure that there's continuity of our, our, our products. So, uh, so I think that there's a real push to actually to improve on nearshoring. Uh, and that, that's not only a thing of the US and Central America, that's true of other big economies and uh, economies nearby. So it's a global movement, and I think Central America has to capitalize on this. Uh, and just to summarize, there, there are perhaps two principal factors there. There's the pull factor, which is improved infrastructure, that uh, also that you um, uh, help to support um, through uh, uh, infrastructure projects we're talking about, uh, and the push factor, which is uh, the failure of supply chains um, brought about by COVID with um, a particularly um, uh, Far Eastern suppliers. So would be those the two factors driving nearshoring? I, well, I think the, the, on the second one in particular, let me add something that I think okay. I find very useful. Uh, manufacturers, uh, like in Europe, are becoming more and more demanding. And they said, uh, yes, we want to have new shoring, uh, but your manufacturer has to be uh, moved by clean energy. By uh, uh, if, if I'm impacting uh, young people without jobs and uh, I'm giving youth an access to decent jobs, that's that's something I value a lot and highly, and I'm willing to pay a bit more for it. So, uh, so there's an, another uh, pull factor that these services, uh, I mean, if we can provide electricity by burning coal very cheaply, but uh, I'm surprised when I see uh, how markets are reacting uh, and companies that had coal plants are saying, I'm shutting down this because my uh, buyer of services or, or my goods it's demanding that I produce with clean energy. So in the market is actually setting a rule that uh, you need to have these provisional services also in a responsible way uh, uh, to the world, not only to uh, a private transaction per se. So I think, again, Cave has been very um, useful for this uh, uh, provision of more sustainable energy. And um, when I look at Costa Rica, uh, is uh, one of the elements that I think makes Costa Rica so attractive is that 99% uh, of the energy they have is 
fully renewable. Okay. So that's very that's that's a full factor. Oh, that's that, that's important. Okay. So there's a, the ESG credentials of the production are are, are better than some of the original. Um, uh, um, areas of production. So we'll explore that. Um, Victoria, uh, Costa Rica, of course, is uh, well known for its uh, um, proximity and engagement um, with the US. The, the shore that's near that we're talking about is, is the US. Uh, perhaps you can talk to us a little bit about um, your direct experience of near shoring uh, and uh, attracting business, which is, which is based on your engagement with this huge uh, North American market. Over to you, Victoria. Okay. Um, well, near the elections, we have a lot of different approaches, but our uh, main commercial uh, partner uh, in all the international uh, relations that we have, of course, is US, USA. Uh, but also, Central America is the second largest market that we do have also. Fair enough. Uh, yes. United States and Central America. These are the first first one and the second one uh, partners that we have for international commerce. So what Dante was mentioning about how to join the, how to linkage all the, you know, railroads and infrastructure in order to integrate all these uh, business. It, I think it's a big challenge that we do have. And I know that maybe he has, this project in his panel, you know, of and priorities also. Because for example, even though we have ports also, and now we are trying to deal a, some kind of a ferry from Costa Rica to Salvador in order to, sometimes to avoid the problems that we have in, in the border lines, in the borders between Costa Rica and Nicaragua or different strikes that we have had in the, in the past near times. So with the, with the USA, we have a lot of manufacturing and we provide services, financial services and medical services for USA. But all the agricultural products, they go through the whole region from Central America. So uh, I think that technologies are also a big, the pandemic showed us that the technology is what is as important as infrastructure. And we have to set up different conditions, you, you know, through the whole region in order we can do business and the e-commerce has to be increased. We have to give different opportunities to SMEs also because that's, a, uh, you know, I was the president uh, from Sempromipe during the last semester. And we found talking to the different ministers that we haven't integrated the business of SMEs. So we, we don't exchange merchandise. Our business, you know, the business of the of SMEs are only into the into each country. And that gives a lot of limitations in order we if we talk about growing and money and financial services and to do this in a big scale, we have to break up all these borders and to set up some kind of legal legal framework in order to increase all these kind of business. Uh, Victoria, do you have in mind, say, the way that the single market works in Europe, for example, where SMEs uh, uh, benefit from being able to trade uh, between France, Germany, Holland, say, Italy? Is that the kind of thing you mean? Tell me a little bit about more of the framework to sponsor inter-regional SME uh, business, which is uh, such an important component of the economy. Mm -hmm. Give me a while. I, I want to know if I understood you uh, right. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll move. I'll come back to you, Victor. I've got, a, I've got another question. I've got a, um, an audience uh, question, which I'm going to put to you, um, Sir Adrian. It's um, about the perception of political risk in the region, particularly as presented in the US. Um, you're a, a, a long time sophisticated uh, uh, investor in the region. How do you navigate um, uh, political risk, and is it as uh, significant as the as its reputation? Uh, is essentially the question. Being infrastructure, um, we are always looking for a sovereign risk guarantee, which goes contrary to what um, private uh, public participation dictates. They're wanting to offload the debt off the country's balance sheet. 
Therefore, what we're asking for is an undertaking, if we undertake the work, that the tariffs to be paid um, to uh, our company for the waterworks or the sewage works is underwritten by law and that the government will ensure that that law is enforced in the event of non-payment by the water authority. And that is the way around that um, all of these have been based on. Um, got it, good. Okay, uh, Louis, so it's, it is a, uh, despite perhaps the uh, uh, unnecessarily um, severe in some places in the US, uh, according to the audience question, it is a navigable market in terms of um, risks you might expect in developing markets sometimes. So look, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I think that um, political risk is in many ways quite binary. It's not there until it suddenly is. Uh, and then right. you kind of need the cover. But actually, I think that the world's moved on in many ways to give investors protections that uh, they perhaps didn't have in the past. And actually, uh, we don't often talk about technology in the legal space, but the way that project financings are documented these days, the great sort of clarity of waterfall of who gets priority in terms of cash flows, the dispute resolution mechanisms that are embedded in these structures as well, can really help to uh, ensure that everybody behaves at the point where there's something difficult going on. Of course, Adrian's absolutely right that, uh, you know, there needs to be the rule of law and uh, the force of law needs to, to be uh, strong. It should not be changed capriciously, but fundamentally, um, willing counterparties should be able to come to commercial terms in a way that uh, sets out with clarity obligations and benefits. Um, thank you, um, Louis. Dante, I wanted to move on uh, uh, to the related topic of uh, capital markets. Um, tell, uh, us a little bit about how um, local capital markets are developing uh, in Central, Central America and how you uh, hope to see them develop, and also talk about uh, CAVE itself as, a, as an actor in capital markets, as you're uh, a, a um, highly credit worthy um, issuer as well. How are local capital markets developing in uh, Central America? Well, I think uh, the region is actually moving uh, slowly uh, towards opening up uh, capital markets, but they're still small and isolated. Even though the region is, is, is pretty much integrated, uh, we are actually trying to open uh, the regional debt market for the sovereigns to actually sell debt uh, uh, across borders. Uh, and this is an agreement reached between all the governments uh, and the central banks and the, the, the stock exchanges. Um, so the 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 the, um, the size of this debt market uh, we estimate is uh, to be about 120 billion dollars, and uh, the moment we announce it and uh, uh, that we have this agreement with all the governments of the region, uh, immediately two stock exchanges actually reach out to us and says, "How can we be a part of this? Because this is uh, the first step towards having a real capital market." Uh, Ourselves at CAVE, we are creating a, a, an equity fund of $1 billion. So we actually want to provide not only debt, but uh, capital to, to businesses that want to move into Central America. And um, part of the problem of having this opening on capital markets is that uh, projects are not prepared. So, it's, uh, so that's, again, CAVE is helping governments and local governments and private sector to prepare projects well, so uh, they can actually go out to the market and, and sell it and uh, attract funds that ours that can go and, and provide financing that debt might not be, it, but uh, equity might be the way forward. So um, I think we are moving forward. I think there's a, uh, I mean, if something positive came of, the, uh, of this pandemic, uh, is that uh, we were forced to use Zoom and Teams to, to, to chat. So we had these wonderful meetings with all the governments and they realized we need to do something different if we want to change what we are doing. Debt is not the only way. So, and our capital market, uh, even though it might be good in my country, is still too uh, small for my needs. So we're opening up and uh, you know we have countries very advanced uh, like Panama, the Dominican Republic and El Salvador that, but you, we also have successors in, 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 in Costa Rica, but still, I mean, this market is too small. So uh, the only way to make it stronger and attractive to the world is to have one place in which you can have transactions for all the region. 
And I'm so glad that Cafe is behind this effort. Mm -hmm. And um, I hope by June, the, the capital market for sovereigns will be open. And uh, we can dream that in a couple of months more, it could be open for the private sector as well. Okay, and both in dollars and local currency? Well, we will begin with US dollars and then eventually we'll open to, to local currency. Yes. Uh, in terms of, um, uh, typically in crises, you see um, capital like flight from developing uh, markets. Uh, we've heard uh, in plenty of places that didn't really happen this time uh, all around the world, uh, not least because there are um, uh, local capital markets evolving and local deposit bases and so forth that weren't there before. Um, how, um, how did the crisis develop in Central America with respect to uh, capital flight or, uh, uh, or not? Well, I mean, I, what I can tell you is from, from our bank's perspective, I mean, during the crisis, we actually we went max into our capacity to provide financing to the region. Um, I mean, particularly, uh, I, I would say that during the crisis, the big organizations that were always behind us, like the World Bank and the IDB, for example, uh, they did froze. I mean, so in, in a way, they left uh, the space open for us to go. Right. Uh, but not because they love us like to that, I mean, it's just that. <laughs> we were just three months up there and, and ready to provide it was an accidental favor. <laughs> That's yeah. right. Yeah. But it, eventually, I mean, what, what, what that proves is during the, an emergency or, uh, you know, a real event like a, the pandemic that no one had foreseen, you do need this uh, provision of capital near you and that understands your needs better than someone that is really far away from you. So, um, so there was no, you know, flight of capital. I think the the um, thankfully the, you know, Cave is a result of the regional integration six years ago, and I think it worked as designed. So we really were able to fill up those spaces that were left mm -hmm. by by the traditional financiers, Excellent. and um, so I think we actually managed the the crisis very well. Uh, and you've been able from. Uh... Uh, from what I've seen, to be able to refinance uh, all of this pretty successfully in the international capital markets as well as, as an issue in your own right. Yes, I mean, I, I mean, Cave actually, uh, you know, in, in the middle of the pandemic, we actually increased our capital base from five billion to seven billion. And uh, I mean, I have some colleagues asking me, what did you do <laughs> to convince countries to actually to put more capital during the crisis? And I said, actually, just show them the value for money. So they said, I mean, why not? I mean, we really need the bank to be stronger. And uh, not only the countries of the region, but also the partners uh, to Cave decided to, you know, uh, basically put up capital in front of, of us to increase the muscle uh, of the bank to provide services. So I think, um, you know, there, there's a good success story in terms of, um, how the this regional bank can actually uh, be quick and decisive in how to help the region, and um, and actually and, and part of the um, I think the 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 key to that was that we were providing solutions as well to the local level uh, emergency programs to the Central America region to refinance debt as well. So in the middle of a crisis, so uh, small and medium enterprises were also. Uh, um, you know, ready to refinance loans because they couldn't repay. Uh, so they were able to get a second loan and, and actually continue with their business. So I think, you know, in a way, uh, the capital markets work nicely during the crisis. So we didn't miss a lot of action because of the crisis. That's, well, that's the major change versus previous uh, downturns, I'd say. So that's, yes. that's very promising. We'll come back uh, to sustainable capital markets in just a moment. There are uh, uh, their own particular thing. Uh, Louis and Sadie have talked about the wall of money uh, available there. Victor, I just wanted to get um, your perspective on local capital markets and um, their use both for uh, local businesses um, for you, but also international businesses that wish to, uh, uh, to near shore invest in, in Costa Rica. Uh, you're on mute at the moment. Yes. Oh. Thank you for the question. Um, I was thinking around because uh, the matter hasn't been easy here in Costa Rica right. during the pandemic. But do tell us. Yeah, for, you know, the situation that the banks had to face in the moment of the pandemic 
when a lot of people, in, you know, in the first moment, a lot of people, you know, their uh, jobs were cut. It. They, okay, they, they, they didn't have any job. The structure of fine, that the banks have been integrated during a lot of years has been more focused not to development, okay, not, not to give financial support to development activities. Uh, they have been giving money to, you know, credits for consume, personal credits. So during the pandemic, the evidence that that was not the best behavior, you know, of the financial markets was really um, very, was really um, evident. So wasn't very easy because the banks they had to set up all their activities in order to um, reorder all the debts that the people had with them in order to not to get more risks that the you know the biggest risk was already materialized the biggest risk had already happened so it was not easy and in central america also costa rica uh, all the informal sectors uh, they have been grown up because the procedures are very hard because we don't have enough incentives in order to do the hint to get formal to, to the people to get formalized so we had the informal sector with debts in the banks. We had formal sector with a lot of debts in the banks, and we have the consumer sector with debts. So the refinance, the refinance, all these activities was not so easy. Right. So at the beginning, at, at the beginning, we had some kind of bonus, you know, with uh, you know, with the, with the budget of the government, in order to make all these people just keep it, don't move too much, keep over there. Because we never thought, I think never, everybody, nothing, nobody thought it was going to be so long, you know, so long crisis, so long the pandemic it was too much time for us. So now, you know, we got some, uh, we got funds from, you know, KB, from the bank, Dante knows the situation, and we got loans that make, that let us as a country to get cheaper debts. So we changed debts, you know, in order to refinance all the national finances. You're, you're so, rescheduling uh, existing debts. Yeah, yeah. We refinanced the existing debts and we have been just going through and we made a very, uh, um, we restructured all the national budget also. So for example, the ministers, we got cut off in a lot of different projects, no consultancies, everything was reduced, really. Was, were, were, was not easy, were very hard times. We were just starting to apply a new law for national finances. And after we had to face the pandemic and we had to, get, we had to give bonus and we had to buy the, uh, the vacuums also. So now in this moment, uh, the, the national banks, you know, the, the, the financial activities, they just grew up last year 2%. What I am also the president of the development bank system, and we grew up 16%, but we just represent a little part of all the financial system. So also we are trying to reconvert all these, uh, the structure of these, um, excuse me, ¿cómo se dice cartera de crédito? Dante, ¿cómo se dice cartera de crédito? Portfolio, your portfolio. Uh, yeah, your portfolio. yeah, <laughs> okay, thank you. We are trying to reconvert all these, but, you know, banks, they got, you know, they get a stock. It's not so easy for them to change the issue. That's my, per my perception. Yeah. I want to tell you that I have been working in, boards of different banks my whole life but now that i am on the other side you know of the street i said hey people you have to change because the business are moving because we have a lot of fintechs because we people is you know creating a lot of different mechanisms in order to get their resources so the market capitals and we have we have been developing different things and the banks i think they have to go on on this rail but it's hard for them to understand because they have a lot of, you know, 
norms and they are global norms, Basilea one, two, three. So they all the time get a stock in all of this. So we are going on different projects that are transforming and we are going on these type of things like green hydro hydrogen, we are going to sustainable tourism, economical sustainable practices, um, you know, sustainable agriculture. So the banks, they feel a lot of risk in this, all this thing. So normally the international banks, they do understand more and they, are, they do understand better than the local banks. That's my perception. Okay? The, hopefully the momentum on um, GDP um, <clears throat> and growth will relieve pressure both on sovereign finances and uh, um, the risk of non-performing loans in banks and so forth. Um, and of course, the situation you describe is true um, all over the world. Uh, we hear it on fifth day in, day out, the discussions about uh, um, uh, Italy uh, and debt sustainability there and its um, work with the NGEU, for example. So it's a, it's a familiar story, I think, um, Victoria. Um, John, whilst we're just talking in. about local capital markets, yes. I, I mean, we're, we're so keen to develop local capital markets because if you look at the infrastructure that is going to need to be built over the next you know, decade plus, uh, most of that infrastructure, to the extent it generates revenue, will generate local currency revenue. Right. And so financing in long dollars doesn't make a lot of sense. It adds right. to the credit risk. And yes. we're willing, as UK Export Finance, to offer guarantees in many local currencies because we think that financing in local currency is, you know, just a better way to finance long, longer term projects. We found quite a lot of resistance because the nominal coupon, the nominal interest rate in many local currencies, just is optically way higher yep. than what has been very low interest rates and in hard currencies. And people don't believe that the differential represents FX depreciation. Right. But it's a pretty decent indicator of right. FX depreciation. Yeah. So we really would encourage, particularly private sectors, it's not for us to guarantee governments in their own currency, but for private sector projects to look at local currency and we would give a guarantee as long as there's some UK content in there. But perhaps not Bitcoin in El Salvador. <laughs> Uh, we'll talk about that <laughs> another day. Uh, often it's a specialist in, uh, in central bank digital currency, but uh, Bitcoin isn't money. We'll come back to that an, uh, another time, you could argue. Um, uh, we, uh, we haven't got long left, and I do want to uh, revisit the theme of uh, sustainability. We've, uh, uh, we've all talked about that, uh, whether it's um, uh, sources of energy in Costa Rica uh, or Sir Adrian's um, uh, water treatment plants. Um, Dante, um, Paint a portrait for us, please, of uh, the sustainable development of the region, both in terms of projects, uh, infrastructure, and in terms of finances, or interesting activities in all of those things in Central America. Let me give you the, uh, the example of Costa Rica, because I, I have Victoria in front of me. Uh, you know, uh, Cabe has been investing in roads for the last 20 years uh, heavily. And the amount of uh, cargo that is being moved is uh, getting, uh, you know, the trucks are getting uh, heavier and, and, and they move more often. So they destroy the roads, I mean, uh, naturally, more rapidly than what we are building them. So it's time to move up the ladder in, in the electric trains. And uh, I got to tell you, I, for Cabe, it has been quite a surprise that we have enabled governments to actually to finance what they need and uh, not what we think uh, is good for them. And uh, so I, and I take this example in Costa Rica because when they wanted to develop the, the train projects, some of my peers uh, did not want to finance those investments because they said that you are not ready, you are too small to start thinking of uh, rail. And uh, so when it was time for Cabe, uh, we said, let's give it a try. I mean, I don't know, I'm just, let's do a, a feasibility study and uh, Let's see how it goes. Uh, so I, I do believe that in Central America, there's a real uh, appetite for this uh, effort in sustainability. Uh, uh, the, we mentioned blue bonds in the report, of course. Yes, I mean, uh, I mean, I have here uh, Sir Adrian that, that uh, he knows that water and sanitation is, is, is an essential part of the business. Uh, we do have uh, countries that depend heavily from tourism. And so we have very successful stories of uh, how water and sanitation make sense not only for health issues, uh, but also for tourism and other services. Uh, so, but back to the sustainability part of the equation, 
And this is something I, I, I like to, to repeat to, to everyone is that it's not only good for the global good of a good environment, it also makes sense for your pocket. You can make more money if you are sustainable in the, in the long term. So um, we should not be afraid of uh, at this stage of uh, doing what we need to do. Uh, I mean, we can look at the history of the UK and the industrial revolution. I mean, there, I, I love one headline that, uh, uh, that was published in some newspaper in, in Central America saying that this time was the time of the industrial, the green industrial revolution of Central America, like in the UK, a uh, time in which you need to actually change the model because what you have is not sustainable. So, uh, I mean, uh, I, I really applaud Costa Rica's efforts to go against, you know, experts that said, you know, don't do it because you are too small. I mean, uh, you do what you need to do and uh, you actually reach out to um, helping hands and there also is going to be one if you have a good idea and it's well thought out why not uh, you will if you have a well designed project believe me uh, investors will come if they see a profit behind it uh, they will come but you have to ensure that the design of these projects actually makes sense so for us it's actually relatively easy to go out to the capital markets and sell uh, you know, social or environmental bonds, because we do have a story to tell, like what Elian was, was mentioning about the Lake Managua. Uh, but that's also true for, uh, you know, in the port of Limon in Costa Rica, uh, we just uh, uh, help Costa Rica finance a sanitation plan at the port. So now you have a city that isn't only uh, doing, you know, uh, commercial activities at the port, but it's also encouraging tourism to come back to a, a, a part of the country that was not very attractive for tourism. So uh, it makes sense to have a little bit of what is involved. In so that's right. Yeah. So it's not only a public good, it's also a private good that you actually, uh, it makes sense to go into that agenda to ensure that you are sustainable as well. Okay, I'm going to come to you, Lou, in a minute as, a, as someone involved in the investor landscape. It's a very difficult thing to navigate ESG in many ways with the uh, standard setting as a work in progress, but uh, there is a wall of money. But um, Victoria, I was interested to hear from the uh, from your point of view, uh, how you're navigating as a government the um, issues of sustainable development in Costa Rica. <clears throat> okay. Because, um, you know, Thinking in sustainability, it's a cultural factor that has been in this country for almost 50 years, since we started to, you know, to set up all the conservation national system areas. So we have 25% of the whole land, it is, these are public conservation areas. And the other 25% is they are private conservation areas. So, the people started to think about business with these conservation areas more or less 25 years ago when they started talking about concepts from ecotourism. But we have a big challenge, you know, before I was a ministry, a minister, I used to work in environmental, poli political, uh, environmental policy and environmental management. But now I am the, from the side of the economics, you know, development, rural areas, we have a weakness and we have to be honest. All the time we get funds for conservating the forest, for conservating all these fall down, all these waterfall, for conservating whatever you want. We are not given an integrated perspective. How is the community related with all these conservation areas getting de as developed as this conservation area? It's not only to preserve or to conserve. We have to give conditions and uh, economical conditions, education conditions, highway conditions to the people that lives around all this. The, so the, if we go to the South, uh, yeah. ESG is S as much as the E, you, I think you'll say. Yeah, that's true. If you go to the South part of the country, you know, in the cross border, all these, in this South part of the country, we have 25% of the whole conservation areas of the country. 3% of the biodiversity of the world. Right. And there is a lot of, there are, there is a lot of, you know, poor people. 
Yeah. And it doesn't match you that you have a very fancy, nice boutique hotel over there and you go down to the community and there are a lot of needs. So we have to make some kind of balance in this area because that is my perspective now that I have to work for all these people and to, to promote the conditions, you know, in order to give development to all these communities. So I do agree with the conservation. I think tourism is, you know, uh, it, tourism is one of the activities that make, might has the potential to give development, economic, you know, and economic growth and sustainability. And we are going down, you know, we are going all the time, uh, giving more, um, reinforcing all these policies. But we have to take care of the people who is fishing also, which are the conditions, not only economical conditions. So we have to give an integrated vision in order to give, a, you know, a balanced development. And if Costa Rica has decided, you know, to preserve it in order to make, you know, to go on a fair fund, for example, okay, the fair fund includes people, not only regions and biodiversity and the conservation of different species. That is, again, one of um, my, my, my perception now that we have this conversation, and I think it's the moment where we could mention this. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Victoria. And, and my day began discussing the trade-offs in ESG and is rightly concluding there. It's, uh, it's much more complicated uh, than it superficially um, appears, important though it may be. I want to finish up now, perhaps, uh, Louis, to ask you how important it is for you as uh, someone who may help facilitate finance for projects in the region, um, um, how high up the list of things you have to worry about is the ESG credential of the thing that you're helping to facilitate? Well, look, John, it's, it's incredibly important. I mean, uh, the UK government is very forward leaning, has been COP president uh, recently, uh, and has made some really ambitious uh, moves that we're hoping a lot of others will, will follow and then better as well. So net zero by 2050 is not only a UK government pledge, it's a UK export finance pledge as well, but it's not about 2050, it's about 2030 and what we're gonna do between now and then. So actually UK government policy is that we will no longer support any overseas fossil fuel projects. That's not just coal, not just oil, but gas as well. So it's made our lives actually quite easy. We are focused on clean growth. We don't have to worry about how to do a hydrocarbon project in a responsible way anymore. We're just not gonna do them. Uh, it doesn't mean that they don't, that the world isn't gonna need gas. Uh, it doesn't mean the world's not gonna need, need oil, even the UK. But it does mean that we're focused on helping to propagate the technologies that will help people to realize net zero by 2050, because there's not a single net zero by 2050 pledge out there that can be done without technologies that do not yet exist. And so we've got a duty as a UK, a creative economy, to develop those technologies and to propagate them through trade uh, and to sell these abroad and to help facilitate the purchase overseas of these technologies are going to create a more sustainable world. This is a world where there are no developed markets anymore. We're all developing markets yes. in relation to net zero. Yeah. And we have to undertake this as a kind of global endeavor. It's fine to look after the UK's net zero pledge, but we're all in this together. Okay. So, I mean, you know, we're not um, uh, saying we're, we're a climate change agency that happens to do a bit of export credit. We right. are an export credit agency, yes. but we will have good standards. Uh, things like the IFC environmental standards, we're Kuwaita Principles Financial Institution. We are pushing at the OECD for our uh, partners to uh, have higher standards. So uh, as of the last, uh, as of November, no more support from OECD export credit agencies for coal-fired power stations overseas. Uh, so those sorts of things we're pushing, um, but at the same time, we are realistic uh, and we will look to, uh, to do projects that will help drive sustainability. Well, there's transition finance as well, Absolutely. but that's a whole other hour that we won't do just Indeed. today. Yeah. But uh, um, thank you, that's very helpful. Last word uh, to you, Dante. Um, what do you think that we'll see over the next 10 years in the region? What, what are the things that excite you about the region in terms of its economic development uh, that you think the rest of the world should notice? Good question, uh, and I hope to be right. Uh, no, uh, I always say that uh, it's easy to change things when you don't produce them. And uh, I think uh, electric mobility is an aspiration of Central America. And um, 
And one of the reasons why I'm here today in the UK is because I'm looking for what Louis was describing, this ingenuity of uh, UK producers in how to do things better and differently. I mean, when I look at electric buses, uh, hydrogen power, a taxi, I mean, why is it that we cannot dream in Central America to have uh, one of the regions to be one of the first ones to have a totally clean transport sector? Uh, that should not be a dream. I mean, the technology is, is here today. Uh, Cave has the funding and the financing. Actually, we have even funding from the Green Climate Fund in which uh, the UK is a big donor of it. Uh, just on the promise that we can deliver these transformational technologies to the peasants and the small farmers. Uh, so they can actually be a part of this movement to become more sustainable in the future. So my aspiration for Central America is that we can be an example of how, uh, you know, you don't need to be the Brazil of, of, of Latin America to, to be a leader. Uh, we don't produce cars, we buy them. So we might, might as well buy them hybrid today and start the transition from today, mm -hmm. uh, probably by 2030, we can be the first region in the world that we stop using, uh, you know, uh, internal combustion cars. So uh, just to be responsible because we, in Central America, we are actually um, not a big producer of greenhouse uh, gases, but we actually do suffer the consequences every year in and out uh, with hurricanes or droughts. So uh, we cannot be just the eternal victims. We should also be uh, you know, part of the solution towards this global problem and show the world that it is possible. Uh, the technology is there. We have the partners here. We have the, the companies that are able to transform, uh, you know, sectors that were basically disregarded in, in the last 20 years. Uh, so my aspiration is that we can truly be a sustainable region uh, and uh, just and not just say it, but actually prove it with uh, our investments. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Victoria, Sir Adrian, uh, Louis, Dante. Thank you very much for talking to us uh, today. A uh, very interesting tour of a very interesting region, uh, and you've um, and highlighted lots of um, excellent um, uh, areas for our audience to explore. Uh, please do download our report from our website uh, for lots more information on all of these themes. Uh, thank you all for uh, listening today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.